We're so glad to have you here with us for our May edition of Native Plants at Noon. Uh, I have to share with you that one of our presenters texted me this morning and Alex says, we have a major problem with native plants at noon. Uh, so my blood pressure jumps and you know I'm gonna have a heart attack. Uh, and then she tells me, there are just too many wonderful plants blooming right now. And she's absolutely correct. So uh, with that in mind, we'll get started just as quickly as we can here. Um, if you have questions as we go along, please try to put those in the Q&A. Uh, I can find them a lot more easily that way. Uh, and either I can provide some answers or we'll get those to Alex and Sydney as we can between plants. Um, before we do get started, I do want to give a quick shout out and thanks to the Missouri Department of Conservation Native Plants at Noon is a um, partnership with Deep Roots and MDC. Um, we wanna thank them for everything they do to help encourage and empower people to plant more native plants. So without further ado, like to have Sydney and Alex join us and take it away. Let's go see some plants. Hello, hello. We hope, we hope you're all doing well today on this muggy Kansas City afternoon. Um, this is Alex. That's Sydney. And we are the Native Landscape Specialists here at the Anita B. Gorman Conservation Discovery Center in Kansas City. And today we're going to be talking about some really cool plants. Uh, but before we begin, we have a book we want to talk about. Um, it's uh, all about how to maintain your perennial garden. And Alex is going to talk a little bit about it. And then we'll jump into plants. Yeah. So our book this month <laughs> that we're featuring is the no maintenance perennial garden and it's all about getting to know your plants and what works in your region what native plants um how they act in the more formal settings in the more um design spaces and it's got some great layouts in here and some information about some native plants it does use a bit of um cultivars which we don't typically recommend but there's a lot about true natives in here too yeah so yeah it's a great book to get started if you're trying to design or if you're if you're trying to add um, um native plants into a design or start a whole new design too. yeah and so the author is roy diblick and the book is called the no maintenance perennial garden and uh, alex can you touch on just a little bit um when someone plants their garden uh, I think the common misconception, especially with natives, is that it's no maintenance at all, right? Like N-O, not K-N-O-W. Right. <laughs> um, so for the first couple of years, you have to weed. It, like, is that right? You have to like kind of maintain it that way until yeah. it's established? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the pun or the joke behind the title of it is that if you know your plants and how they function with each other, then you're going to have a more successful planting with less weeds. And we've talked about that a bunch of times about how important it is to have a green mulch, which is your base layer, and then to add in your flowers and, and start with your structural plants up top, but have those three layers and make sure that you're taking up as much of the space as you can so that you don't have, um, you're not giving weeds opportunities mm -hmm. to come in and you're letting these plants thrive um, the way that they want yeah. to. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Okay. So what's the first uh, plant we're going to be talking about So the about first today? plant we're going to be talking about, now this one I would kind of consider like a taller green mulch. Um, we have it in some beds where uh, we need to maintain a shorter um, area. And this is meadow anemone. This is this lovely little flower down here. Oh, this one has a little beetle on it. Oh, it's so cute. cute. It might be a weevil. Um, and this plant does well in full sun to part shade, um, hence the name meadow. Um, this one has a tiny spider on the deck. Oh, it's so cute. And it's doing really well in our courtyard garden where it's kind of, it's in like, I mean, this is like part. This is sun, part, part, part shade, sun. Probably, right? Well, no, I think it gets some afternoon sun here. Just well, it depends on what side yeah. of it actually. I think where we're standing right now. Yeah. This, it did, but basically it does well in like, uh, it would do well under the edges of, um, under a big tree in a yard specifically yes. where it's getting yeah. a little bit of light throughout the day. It's I, so I actually was not familiar with this plant until this year. I saw it blooming and I was like, Alex, what is this beautiful plant? And, uh, I've, I've been hooked ever since I love, just look at that. Like, it's kind of like a ocean or like a little swath of, yeah. um, it, yeah. So it spreads out nicely. I'm guessing it establishes itself 
pretty easily. Is that right? Yeah, it does. So it's, it would be a good plant to have in a situation where you're going to have a shrub layer or a short tree layer or something, or you want to do like a um, monoculture with more aggressive plants. Um, I would not plant it near um, like delicate shade plants. Okay. This is more of a ground cover. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So then we'll move on and we apologize for the construction noise. There's a jackhammer um, doing, its there, thing. doing its thing. So we're going to try to be very, very loud while we do this. Let we're us know if you can't hear us. Yeah. We will scream. Or else they would have gone to lunch at noon, but I guess not. So here we have some of our irises blooming and we have several different native irises. Um, there we have Southern, in this bed we have Southern blue flag, copper iris, and um, Shreve's iris. Shreve's, is that right? Shreve, yeah. Shrevei? Shreve's. Yeah. Um, which is a new one to us. And that's this one over here. It's so beautiful. It's a, it's a bit brighter than the, the Southern blue flag. So these, yeah, what's kind of, can I touch on it real quick? What I told you yesterday. Yeah. Um, I, I saw this, uh, purple iris, the Shreve's iris here. And I was like, is this? A hybrid between the southern blue flag and the copper and now it's like no no it's not <laughs> but you know because those two color combos anyway so what do we know about the shreves so iris? this well all of these irises are um doing well in this um uh this is like our iris bed and it's it's medium moisture and it's a little bit of shade but they get they get quite a bit of sun here um this i really like this one because it's got multiple a flowers per stem. Some of the other natives don't have as as prolific of blooms. This would be really lovely in like a mass planting. Yeah. These are really good. All the irises are really good for rain garden situations, which is my favorite way to use them. And if you come to visit the Discovery Center, you'll have to check out our rain garden. We don't have time to go over there today, but it's it's blooming. It's, it's looking beautiful. so good. And, it's very lush. And we really need like right now is a great time to figure out what your water situations are in oh, your yeah. yard because of all the flooding that we're going to have or we have had this week and, and we're going to have coming up too and um, figure out where maybe you could fit in a rain garden or some water retention um, style gardens with these plants. So this is copper iris. This is the iris that we have most commonly here at the Discovery Center. And it does well here. It also does well in um, kind of a heat island over by the pavilion oh, on the right. edge of a bed. Yeah. It unfortunately does not stand up to um, uh, competition very well. So they, this bed kind of needs to be maintained a bit more delicately than some of our other beds. Um, but if you had the right combination of, um, ground cover species and irises, that would work really well. Um, it can't compete with blue star. Yeah. <laughs> specifically. Do we want to touch back on the blue flag or? Oh yeah. You can show that one. That's, show it one more yeah, time. Same. So we That's have the copper, yeah, copper, the shreves, yeah. and, and then, then blue flag flag right here yeah. so you can see how they beautiful look at the um these are the little... nectar or the um pollen the runways for the bees it's a bee fashion show so sweet? <laughs> everybody loves bee butts. Yes, bee butts all right okay so now sydney's gonna take over and do the next two species for us yeah so we're gonna be talking about blue false indigo um, it, which is Baptisia australis. This is one of my favorite native plants. I've talked about it a lot. I always will. Um, so check this out. First, let's get kind of a view of the overall structure of this plant. This, were, like we did not prune this. This is just how this plant looks. It's very, this is a very mature plant. Um, how old do you think this one is? Do you know? I don't know. That one could be as it's old as old like, size. yeah, that, that's definitely mature Two, size. Yeah. Um, but then you can see these smaller ones here when they first start out. But they have this nice structure to them. Um, what's kind of cool about it, the size, I think that the foliage and the flowers are gorgeous. But um, in the winter time, the leaves turn this like beautiful silvery charcoal color. I call it my goth baby because I just think it's so pretty. Um, it's kind of that like dark uh, leaf that hangs around in these great um, seed pods. Um, you know, that just stands out in the winter time next to all the browns and of uh, red colors. So, uh, but the nice thing about maintaining this plant, I mentioned it's pretty low maintenance, but at winter time, once the plant is done, and if you don't want to leave it in your garden, that's fine. You can just break it off at the stem. It just comes right off um, and it does grow, grow back the next year. But 
the uh, specialized structure for this plant, why it does that is it's one of Missouri's tumbleweeds. So the, it breaks off and it, it can roll around and that is how these seeds get germinated. They need to have like an abrasive surface to scarify them. Um, and that's how the seed germinates. So that's why this plant will break off and go away. And then the next year it sprouts right back up. They kind of look like, I think like pasta sprouts a little bit. I know hostas are not native, but when I first saw this coming back up, it's, it's what it kind of reminded me of. Um, but so is it what the, in the flower, it's in the pea family, right? It is, yeah, it's a legume. Um, and so you can tell it's got that pea, like if you grow peas in your garden, um, you might notice the flowers look really similar. Um, and so it's kind of cool because bees have to force their way in here. Yeah, to get that's to the strong, nectar and the takes pollen. a strong bee to get into yeah, that. It really does, yeah. So they do force their way in to get the nectar and then they cover themselves in that uh, pollen to help pollinate this plant. Um, so again, yeah, the common name is blue false indigo and the Latin name is uh, Baptisia australis. And speaking of common names, Alex, do you wanna talk a little bit about uh, how common names aren't the best? Yeah, I'm a, as we're walking to the next plant, I'm gonna talk very loudly about, <laughs> about how common names are um, tricky. And I'm actually gonna use, Sydney, an example of someone you were helping design a garden for that accidentally bought the wrong plant because yeah. they just went based on the um the common name, name and what she was trying to get them to to get was um indigo bush, bush. and what they ended up with was wild or uh, uh, blue, blue false, false indigo, indigo. Yeah, blue or wi wild indigo blue yeah wild blue indigo um anyway common names are tricky Oh, indigo is a common name used for a lot of plants because they assumed or like thought that Native Americans used um, that as a blue dye. It does not work. It, it's not. It's not. <laughs> it's not. Yeah, but this is in. So yeah, we're coming up on a bush that's completely different than the one we just saw. This is a shrub, yeah. and it's completely different than the plant we just saw. But they unfortunately share very similar common names. They do. So this is the indigo bush, um, and. I don't know if you can see it. There's I a, got bumble a bumblebee. Oh, right yeah, here. good deal. Okay, so there are, it's covered in bees. And if you, I don't know if you can see it, but if you look at the bees' pollen sac, it is bright orange because the pollen on the indigo bush is um, orange itself. Now, um, this is a really great structural plant. I love um, how it looks uh, in terms of leaves and the flowers, but it is a little smelly, I think, but <laughs> it, it, it's bleeding. I just had to bring it up. To me, it kind of smells like burnt rubber, but it's not that bad. I'm just being a little dramatic. I think it's an interesting smell. You should come down to the Discovery Center and give it a whiff. Give it a whiff. Well, it's, not a, it's not sweet. It's not a sweet smelling it's not, flower. It, yeah, it's kind of a savory, like, but the yeah, honeybees love it. They love it. And, and we're they're seeing bumblebees on it, too, but unfortunately, yeah. a lot of these are the uh, we have European honeybees. Local honeybee hive, so... But yeah, so you can see why that would be confusing um, for the common name, because this is an entirely different plant than the blue false indigo uh, that we just showed a moment ago. Uh, this, is a, this is a small tree um, and the, unlike the other plant, which is, you know, it's a perennial um, forb that cut, goes away. So um, it's, that's why it's really important to use the Latin names when you're buying a plant, refer to that. You don't have to know Latin. You don't know. You don't have to memorize it necessarily, or even know how to pronounce it. I know I'm not great at that, but it does help you when you are trying to select the right plant for your property. Um, but yeah. So this is Amorpha fruticosa. Amorpha fruticosa, and the other one is Baptisia australis. Very different Latin names that you could not mistake um, when you're at the plant nursery. So. So this is a great one. wow this bee this this shrub the when these are in bloom they you can hear them you yeah, can hear this bumblebee right there. shrub I'm trying to catch a native bee. yeah there's oh another. there's another they do the fast oh, yeah talk about the, they do uh so, so on some flowers bees do like a, i don't know what the what it's called but they do like a fast run on it <laughs> <laughs> because i think they're trying to pick up more more nectar for like like there's not as much nectar to be had yeah. for a long visit they like try to go really fast um and it's really cute to watch them run yeah it's anyway. super cute <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, so we're gonna. Oh, the jackhammer stopped. Oh, thank goodness. So we're gonna. <laughs> but the, the sirens started. The sirens started. Jackhammer stopped. But as we go our, go to our next destination, Sarah, do we have any questions from the audience? We do. We have a couple on the um, indigo bush. So, uh, can you talk about how uh, you maintain it? Are you guys uh, pruning it? How do you keep it kind of short and shrubby? Wait, which one? You're talking about indigo bush? Which one are you talking about? Amorpha or are you talking about? Sorry, yes, the Not amorpha, the indigo bush that we just okay. talked about. Indigo okay. bush, we do not, do you want, can I no, say yeah, it? Okay, yeah. we don't, um, we don't uh, prune it. We do cut it back from some areas, just like cut it to the ground. But other than that, it stays that height. It's not very tall. It, it gets like maximum here, it probably gets six foot. Like there's one really tall one that's six yeah, foot. Yeah, but that one's mature and it's like, yeah, it's probably about six, five it's and a half. Six yeah, foot. so when I was helping this person with their landscape design, you know, the things I read about indigo bush was that it gets up to 10 feet tall, but looking at the mature ones here, um, I don't see them getting that tall. And then they do get a little weighed down with the flowers, it looks like. Yeah. So maybe that also helps kind of keep the height in check. Yeah, they're not quite a fountain, but they definitely don't have foliage on the bottom. So the foliage is all towards the middle to top and the flowers are at the ends. And so it's not like a bushy full. It's more of a structural, yeah, like would... you could plant stuff around the bottom of it because mm -hmm. it's not taking up a bunch of space where the base of it is. Yeah, I would agree with that. Any more questions? Um, yes. So Aileen asks, uh, do you know offhand uh, what butterflies use amorpha as a larval plant? Oh, that's such a great question. I do not know offhand, but there's a bunch of amorpha. Yeah. It's a host for a bunch of different plants. I know specifically there's a cute moth Aww. that it's a host for, but I cannot think of exactly which ones. I love, um, I love using the Xerces Society um, to find the uh, host, like the host relationships with um, these native plants. Yeah, were you and, saying that you can like type in the plant name? Yeah, and it'll, and give it'll you, tell you that all the yes. different types of larval hosts. Yeah, and Heather Holmes's book too yes. that we spoke about earlier too. Yeah, in a past episode. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. No, I don't know off the top of my head either, but it's it's such a great thing to think about when you're planting. It's not just for aesthetics, right? We're planting uh, beyond ourselves and for ecological purpose. Um, this is habitat and food. Uh, for a lot of wildlife. Bugs are food. Baby are baby moths yeah. and baby butterflies are bird food. Yeah. Without them, we have no birds. And yeah. that's it. That's true. Yeah. So that's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll see if I can find a link and drop it into the chat. Uh, and awesome. then one last, uh, Dennis points out uh, that today is World Bee Day. So. Oh, hey. lovely. That's so nice. Thanks, Dennis. That's really nice. If we can find a native bee to show you, <laughs> they're all a European bee. I, I know. Yeah, there's a hive like not far from It's here. at my house, it's which at is house. <laughs> in the backyard of the Discovery uh, Center. Sorry, guys. Oh, but our, our wildflower honey bit. tastes better yeah. than everybody else. Yeah, I bet it does. Um, we'll find it. We have tons of native bees here. Tons, yeah. I say. Um, but they're just uh, not quite as active well, today. Well, bug, should we show them <laughs> this kind of cool thing? What do you think? Yeah, we'll show this real quick. Do you want me to talk yeah. about it? Okay. Um, so this is a plant called cup plant, which we'll show you when it blooms too, but this is just so cool to, to see. Okay, so these are aphids right here. They're doing the little aphid dance. Yes. Gosh, that won't focus. And I can't remember, is this the native aphid or are these non-native? I think these are native aphids. The ones that we have that are the non-native are the um, right. oleander. The, yeah. The Can you please look at this one because it's just so cool. <laughs> look at these isn't that crazy they're dancing, they're dancing. They're dancing. it's pretty neat and it's not actually harming the plant like the plant will bounce back from this correct yeah the plant this plant will be fine yeah some other plants that might yeah. be more delicate yeah would have a hard time with um aphids but... yeah we, we do have to fight aphids on our like marsh milkweed which like i go to great lengths to try and keep the aphids off of those like extreme lengths like wiping them off of those plants but most of our other plants can totally handle yeah. aphid stuff. All right, um, we're gonna do a little quick handoff here because we want to talk about um, a really special couple plants. You're not gonna believe this, or maybe you do, because you know you're here and you love native plants. But did you know Missouri has um, a couple different kinds of native honeysuckle? 
the non-invasive kind um and it's native so that's take a right. look at these yeah so we you we've spoken probably every episode about bush honeysuckle and how it's the worst the worst um, bush honeysuckle is lonicera macchiae and it is a um, shrub that you can see all over the sides of the roads, everywhere. There goes the jackhammer. The again. jackhammer's um, back. You can see it. It's in bloom right now. And it's about to hit peak, hit peak bloom. So everywhere around Kansas City has honeysuckle, unless someone's managing it, and so, unless someone's getting rid of it. Almost every wild space and every median and every side of the road and everywhere has mm -hmm. bush honeysuckle. Bush honeysuckle is a terrible plant because it kills off everything that grows underneath it. And it's a bad source of food for birds. It's like the wrong kind of protein. It's bad sugars for the birds. It's like a fast um, food restaurant yeah. and that's all there is. Yeah. yeah. And so it wipes out entire populations of native plants um, in the understories of our urban spaces. And then there's no more food for the birds. Yeah. But to, to put it lightly. To, to no, no big deal. No big deal. It. No more food. But no these, more birds, no yeah. more insects, no more animals. No more anything. No pollinators can, <laughs> can feed on bush honeysuckle. Um, but, but we yeah. have a few native honeysuckles. If you're looking to pull your honeysuckle out, which please do, and you want to replace it with something else. A climbing vine, perhaps. Yes. So this, this, these two honeysuckles are vining honeysuckles. Although this one kind of, the yellow one kind like of mounds. has a form to the back of it here. So this is coral honeysuckle, the red one. And it is a hummingbird magnet. Yeah. If you sit still, which I can't do very often, like sit still and not scream. She really can't. Out here. Neither can I, though. <laughs> what am I talking about? Neither can I. If you sit on a rock in the prairie plaza and just watch this um, fort structure, there will be hummingbirds showing up um, quickly. They come and they're, they're, they're eating and hanging out on all of these honeysuckles. So that's coral honeysuckle. And this one is yellow honeysuckle. And can you get a shot of this leaf? It Isn't is so cool. These I I don't know if I've seen other plants with this leaf. So and what what is what is that like type of leaf called? Do you remember? Oh. I'll put you on the spot. I can't remember oh, what it's no, called. It's not Cecil. It's, it's not um, Cecil. But um it's yeah, oh, no, that leaf structure remember. in itself is so beautiful. It's like an mm -hmm. umbrella. And um, yeah, so this is the like yellow honeysuckle. Yeah, yeah it yellow. is like a color. You know, it reminds me of those like um, when King. What was it? Those um, oh, for, ruffs. Like a, it's yeah. a rough. It looks like a rough. <laughs> like a rough. Oh boy. Yeah. So this is Lanacera flava, and this one, the coral honeysuckle of Lanacera sempervirens, and these both have um, sempervirens more so is a um, is uh, is more of an evergreen. It's green. Its leaves will start being green sooner and stay green longer than a lot of other plants that's another reason why bush honeysuckle is planted is because it's nearly evergreen it only yeah. goes dormant for a couple of months in the winter so if that's what you're looking for yeah. yeah yeah um so. so i will say that um you do have to have a trellis or some kind of um structure to hold these vines these are very mature in fact i think we need to we'll be like Try uh trimming these back a little bit. Yeah, we um uh lesson learned. We also had planted Dutchman's pipe vine on this um structure. Oh, it's still there. Is it still there? Oh my gosh, look, it's right there. Um, I have yet to see the Dutchman's pipe vine flower. Wouldn't that be cool if I found oh, a flower of it? Oh, wow, it's, so cool. ah! it's it's like it needs rescuing. We also just bought a bunch of them from um soil service, so we're gonna yeah. plant another dedicated structure or a dedicated section for for those because they're getting yeah. swallowed up they and are. then uh, what's funny actually is that this this plant or this structure typically we have passion vine on it which is another great flower i don't even see any passion i vine was vine. wondering yeah i i, I was thinking earlier nuts. i was like i thought we had passion vine on here but it so here's this cute up. little teepee shaped structure uh kids and people love to go in there and uh hang out it's pretty sweet so next time you're here definitely take a take a moment sit inside the the honeysuckle structure it's kind of nice yeah um, but yeah so th those are kind of the plants we wanted to talk about today is there any last things we want to add to talk about honeysuckle alex i don't think so i um there's um if well if you're if you're thinking about like alternatives to bush honeysuckle because i know i talked about getting rid of that if you weren't trying to play, replace that um then i would go with one of our native shrubs like perhaps nine bark yeah that would nine be a good one is really cute 
and it's blooming right now. It has white flower and it's really beautiful and has a nice form. And it's about the same size as a bush honey supple. <clears throat> Sweet. Okay, so yeah. we're gonna set this up, Sarah. I know we're getting close on time. Do we have any other questions that we can answer before we wrap it up? Yes, there are a few. Um, would you compare, let's see, um, Pat would like to know, is there one honeysuckle native that's more fragrant than the other? That's a great question. Um, I, 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 yeah, we have a smell. <laughs> I haven't noticed, um, the fragrance on these two being, being very strong. That is unfortunately one of the nice things about the bush honeysuckle. And one of the reasons why people planted it so prolifically is because it does smell amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Are you getting anything? I'm here to report back that they don't really, they smell, I mean, it's subtle, but it's not as fragrant. Yeah. But, you know, here's one thing you could do um, uh, with the invasive honeysuckle is cut off the flowers. Yes, go cut, cut them right now. Cut them now because yeah. if you do that, you're going to prevent the berries from forming. Uh, yes. Don't, we don't really uh, promote cutting the branches when there's berries on them because then you're spreading seed. Um, you know, because I, I actually brought that up. I'm like, why don't we use that as decoration in wintertime? And Alex is like, well, you know, that's a good in theory, but then we're spreading more of this invasive species, but yeah. cut the flowers, put in a bouquet. Yeah. Smells good. And you're doing yes. uh, the environment a service. So. And they're edible too. There's tons of recipes out there for honeysuckle stuff. Nectar. Things you can make. Nectar. Simple syrup. Nectar. Simple syrup. <laughs> Simple syrup. Um, you can make wine out of them. Um, Maybe even a jelly, I bet. I would take a lot of honeysuckles, but I remember as a kid, you know, cause this stuff is everywhere. Like it lines all the, I used to hang out like in the waterways and look at the plants and the animals and stuff. And I would take the flowers off the honeysuckle and just kind of yep. drink the next. So. Yep. So that, that's fun. Have your kids do more of that. That's yes. what we were talking yes. about. We were like, let's set the kids on the honeysuckle. Yes. Like touch, yeah. show, make sure they all know the honeysuckle trick, how to get the nectar out mm -hmm. and then set them loose. And on then the forest. chop them down. Eat chop all the flowers. flowers. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so as you're cutting down your shrub honeysuckle, can you keep the limbs to build structures uh, similar to the teepee behind you or should those be hauled away? You can use the limbs to make structures. Do not use the limbs in a brush pile or make, don't make mulch out of it, I guess. You can put it in a brush pile, but know that like everything that is that brush pile is used for and everything underneath it is probably going to die yeah but that's typically how brush piles are anyway True. i don't i don't mind you can burn it it burns really i was nicely. gonna say i like it as a bonfire me too material <laughs> i mean who but, there, but, but there i guess there wouldn't be any harm using it for a like structure it yeah. but it also is not very unless you have like a very very old one they can get bigger when they're very old yeah i saw um one of my friends cut down a honeysuckle and the trunk was this big. I need to show you a photo of that. It was crazy. So. You just don't want to mulch. You don't, because of the toxins basically mm -hmm. in it that make it a lilopathic, you don't want to mulch and add it into your other gardens. Great question. Great question. All right, let's do one more. Um, Ashley says, aphids have been all over my cone flowers. Um, mm -hmm. Is that a plant that can handle it or um, what should she do about that? Yeah, coneflower yeah. can definitely handle it. I'm really like the only one I'm really thinking of is the swamp milkweed, which is so delicate, and we only have like four of them because yeah. we suck at keeping them alive, I guess. And they, they, yeah, they just don't like our situation right here, and and then they're suffering further from the aphids. So that's extreme. Yeah. I, I, we don't worry about aphids on any of our other no. stuff. But what if it's a, a really young, like maybe they just got a like a seedling, like one of the ones we we grew. What uh -huh. if that's covered in aphids? I mean, technically, okay, the situation I could see happening is if the aphids kill off the seedling, you're still going to have the root system probably, mm -hmm. and probably the leaves are going to be able to recover from that. Maybe not on like a tiny seedling, right? but the aphids would then kill off their food source and then they would die. So yeah, lose, lose for them. It's all, biodiversity you, is really important. Let me just yeah. say in aphid control, the more insects you can get coming to your garden, the more types of flowers, the more types of shelter you have for insects, the less your aphids are going to be an issue because you're going to have people or people, <laughs> insects, insects specifically, <laughs> uh, and, and birds coming to eat them. Yeah. Um, if you have a small plant that you're concerned about, what is a friendly way to remove aphids that won't harm, say, your monarch caterpillars or other species that are coming to use the plant? 
<gasps> Squish it. <Bitch. laughs> take your Spray finger. Rub very them. Gel- if you it's rub them, you don't they have to die. Use yeah. But you could just take like a, a damp uh, paper towel wipe them off yeah um, i would not spray anything if you have cats on there for specifically like at the time i wouldn't caterpillars spray they, caterpillars. The caterpillars can last. <laughs> I was thinking, sorry cats yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, the, the um uh caterpillars can coexist with aphids on milkweed no problem like on our other milkweeds they're fine together uh, if it's a tiny plant though and you're like desperate to save it just wipe them off just wipe them off. we use neem oil in the greenhouse but that's before they get if that if we do end up getting aphids in the greenhouse we do use neem oil which i think is more organic than other yeah. kinds of pesticides have you found if you've heard like the dish soap solution thing have you found that even works that'll kill your caterpillar too oh, so it doesn't yeah, matter right. yeah. yeah but what if there's no caterpillars on it yeah that's probably that fine yeah. Rub, rub Epsom salt or apple cider vinegar on your plants, whatever you take whatever cotton you ball, do. little dab. Dude. Yeah. But seriously, if you just take the leaves between your hand and go like this, have your kids do it. Maybe they like squishing bugs. <laughs> <laughs> We're all about kids doing most of the work. Yeah. You know, <laughs> get the kids involved any way we can. <laughs> but don't smash all other right. bugs. <laughs> don't. Yeah. Bugs are really important. They're, remember, they're bird food. We need them. Yeah. We need them. We need if, without them. bugs, we would not uh, exist. So, anyway. Excellent. Thank you. Um, all right. I think that's all the time that we have for questions today. So Alex and Th- Sydney, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to put up some information here. Great. Right. And we will dance and distract you while you talk about that. As always, I appreciate it. Thank you. So um, if you have been uh, enjoying the Native Plants at Noon series, I hope that you will make it out to the Discovery Center for either one of their upcoming events or um, just to visit and check out all the things that are blooming. We um, probably didn't even cover a third of them today. So uh, you can go check that out. I just put a link in the chat to upcoming events at the Discovery Center. That page will also have the address. Um, And so... The, um, they are actually distracting me. So uh, anyway, uh, we hope that you will consider attending our Planet Native Landscapes Conference. It's coming up this September 22nd through 24th. Uh, and this will be an online conference uh, as well as uh, having some recordings available afterwards. Uh, so if you're not able to join us live, uh, just as all of these series, um, you can view it later. So please check out planetnative.org for more information on that. You may also be interested in our evening webinar series. We are nearing the end of that. This Tuesday evening is our final one with Wendy Sangster. Uh, She is with the Missouri Department of Conservation and will talk to us about native tree selection and care. Uh, So we hope you'll tune in for that one. To register, just visit deeproots.org and click on events at the top of the screen. Um, And while you're there, we'd be awfully grateful if you would consider making a donation to Deep Roots as well. We hope that you have a wonderful day um, and we will see you back here for our next Native Plants at Noon on June 17th. Take care, everyone.